Welcome to today's episode of Decisions Now. I'm Erin Pearson, uh, your host, and um, alongside Rigby Chavala, our co-host. And today we are very excited to have Christopher Sanchez. He is the founder and CEO of Emergent Line and has created the AI Bill of Rights, which we're going to be talking about um, a bunch today. And Christopher, one of the things I think is really fun and interesting about the conversation we're going to have is... Um, and how you founded Emergent Line is that you're really looking at the collaboration between um, humans and AI, which is clearly something that um, Rigby and I talk about quite a bit, certainly on this podcast, but then um, in everyday life and what we do as well. Um, So I think this is going to be a a great conversation um, and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yep, Welcome, Christopher. It's an interesting set of topics uh, that we have lined up. Uh, I don't think we've ever talked about AI Bill of Rights uh, before. So uh, excited for this conversation. So something new. That's always good. <laughs> exactly. So actually, with that in mind, then, Christopher, do you mind telling us or just like telling the audience, what is the AI Bill of Rights? How did it come along and um, how did you uh, create it? Yeah, well, so I think the best way to do this is for us to time travel 16 months into the past. And so 16 months ago, we had just founded Emergent Line, and we started out, and our mission is to be the most human-centric AI company in the world. And so we want to create products that not only empower end users, but also empower workers. So we're not trying to automate people out of their jobs. So along this you know, time that we launched, we were contacted by a ton of people in the responsible AI space, you know, ethical advising, all these different things. And they wanted to structure an agreement to advise our clients. And so I said, I think this is a brilliant thing for us to do. We should absolutely do this. And so I started speaking with a ton of them. I spoke to about, I would say, almost 40 different companies. And what I found is that while all of them had great points, all of them were well-intentioned and had amazing ideas, they all tended to differ. And what happens is that it's very hard to put that into like an MLOps program. Mm-hmm. Right. So I can't go and say, OK, well, we're doing this here at Emergent Line and then we're going to introduce you to this other company. And then there's a lot of differences there. So with one of the companies we spoke with, I got along really well with the CEO, this brilliant young woman. And uh, we started discussing how to move this forward. And so I told her, I said, you know, a great way that I think we can make this work is if we just put together how we look at data practices. <clears throat> right to start. And if we provide that to you, do you think that we could get on the same page? She told me, I think that's a great idea. So let's do that. We spent the next few days putting some things together and we said, this is more than just a PDF. Like maybe we should share this with more people, see what they think, show our clients, see, see what their opinions are. And also so people could tell us if we were wrong. I mean, that's the big thing, especially in this space. We want to be told if we were wrong. So we found that dataoath.org Right. And we put up some different ideas. We wrote a story called the absurd dinner bill to kind of give people who were outside of the AI space, like a a very simple three to four minute story so they could see why it was relevant to them. Much to our surprise, in the first month, we had just under 9000 unique visits and we had hundreds of people reach out to us from academia, from the investment community, from the startup community, from around the world. First off, that was a surprise because it wasn't like we didn't think it was going to be that we thought, oh, Maybe my mom will, will watch it or read it, you know, some other people and, but nothing like that. And so one of the topics that came up were user rights. Mm-hmm. You know, what about user rights? How do you ensure user rights? All these different things. And so we spoke with a lot of the people that has sent in comments to the data oath to see what their points of view were. So then we started looking around and we said, okay, well, how should we address this? Is this something that we should do or is it something someone else should do? Because I was very hesitant because I'm not an AI ethicist. I haven't been doing this for 20 years. I don't have a PhD in in AI ethics or philosophy. And so there's a bit of hesitation whenever you go into a new uh, industry or a new topic. And so then we said, okay, let's start off by say, setting these certain foundations. And then we said, let's make a bill of rights for AI. And we will start defining, along with the community, what are certain rights that users should have in a global sense? 
right? Because AI is inherently global, right? And then what would that algorithm look like that applies to those rights? And then what are the data practices? Because the data practices feed the algorithms that would ensure those rights, right? right? So if, if there's one thing that I'll, that I'll touch on, I firmly believe everybody wants to do the right thing. Everybody inherently is a good person, but you also have to make it simple for them to do the right thing. Like it, it's, it's no different than working out, right? Like if I were to ask anyone on the street, I'm like, would you like to be healthy or unhealthy? I can't imagine someone saying, you know what, Chris, I was really thinking about it. I want to be unhealthy. I want to be in pain. I don't, I don't want to sleep. They would want to be healthy, but oftentimes there's an abundance of information. Like there are abundance of frameworks to address AI and AI ethics, but it can be very hard to apply to your business. Hmm. Right. And so then we said, okay, if this is something we're, we're going to do, can it be operationalized as our point of view from day one? Right. And so then I've talked a little bit, I can fill in a bit more about the A Builder Rights, but now you kind of got to where we started and then I can fill in some other interesting things that came from there. I'll put your, I'll put your listeners to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> well, <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, you mentioned how can we make it simple enough to operationalize it, right? Uh, can mm -hmm. you pick one example of one such right or uh, a practice, data practice? Yeah. So, for example, one would be algorithmic due process, okay. right? And so when you think about algorithmic due process, one of those key aspects is explainability, mm -hmm. right? And a key thing to understand that, so how you can operationalize it is you have to split, at least the way we look at it, you have to split AI in two. You have human impact and you have non-human impact AI. And then you have some that start to approach towards the centers, and that's where human judgment, you know, comes in, comes involved. But when you look at human impact AI, that's where you have to have explainability with what's going on. So this allows you to say, if I want to understand um, protein folding, if I want to do reinforcement learning, if I want to do black box for all these other topics that are non-human impact, mm -hmm. that's fine. You would still be in compliance with the Global Bill of Rights. It's only when you're going to impact what someone, when you think of, of machine learning, what does it do? It distributes services, opportunities, you know, mm -hmm. when you think about it, it distributes decisions, mm -hmm. right? And so when you think about that, if you're determining, okay, is a package going to be delivered to my house on Monday and it ends up on Wednesday, that's not high human impact for the most part. But if I'm determining whether or not you get a job interview, mm -hmm. if I'm determining whether you get promoted, if I'm determining your insurance premiums, mm -hmm. right, that you're going to pay because... When, when we think about this, we think about the everyday person, right? I don't, I don't think about so much people that are, that are on this call, you know, the people that are listening to it, cause they're all very sophisticated at the end of the day. But we think when we build AI, about the everyday person who gets up six, six thirty in the morning, gets their kids to school, gets their lunch ready, takes off when they're driving to work, they're not thinking. I wonder if the AI algorithms I dealt with today gave me all the opportunities I should get. I wonder if I'm seeing the right ads mm -hmm. to give my kids the best possible life. I wonder if I was rejected from that job because an algorithm denied it to me. Mm -hmm. They're not th they have so many other things to, to think about. And I believe as AI practitioners, we have a responsibility not only to create amazing products that improve people's lives, but to think about everybody who will be impacted, even if we never see them, even if they never use our products, but to at least be saying that these are the standards that we believe should exist in the community, right? And so when you start thinking, okay, so explainability, how would that work? A big thing is also, how do you think when you're creating these products? So when you're creating your system, you can say, okay, how do we collect these people's data? Mm -hmm. How do we get it? Who is represented in this data? Okay, but actually think about it. Who can we think of? Like, let's make a list of all the people that exist in society. Like, you can look at your news channels. You can look at whatever. That's also why it's good to have a diverse team. And you can say, who is not represented here and can we represent them? Okay, if the answer is no, even if the system works for certain subpopulations, but doesn't work clearly, because remember, the problem with AI is problems happen at scale. It doesn't impact one person. It impacts tens of thousands of people at once and very fast. 
And I think if you're dealing with human impact, so whether it's for a mortgage application, job application, getting into school, um, recidivism rates, like or recidivism decisions, all these different things, you really have to think about, are the appropriate people being represented? And so that's one of the questions you should be asking when you're putting this data together. The other thing you should be thinking of, okay, how am I ensuring with these outputs? How am I testing it? that people are being treated correctly, not just from theoretically, like when I'm in the planning stage, but when I start testing it, how am I doing that? So right now, what we're doing is we've shared these rights with several dozen startups mm -hmm. and we're asking them, say, how would you apply this within your system? Got it. How would you apply it? Because we know that we can't just sit here and like from Mount Olympus and say, you, you shall do X, Y, and Z. We know that everybody is equally brilliant. They have amazing ideas. And so from there, we're collecting all these insights and we're saying, okay, what are the universal truths, the universal applications that we find from dozens of startups in the AI field that they use to apply these uh, principles, right? How are they then measuring that it was done? And then we're going to be releasing that for everyone else to go and read and observe and to see how that worked. That's cool. So Christopher, I had a question just to follow follow up. So we've talked a little bit about how this um, really, it's there to impact the everyday worker and you need to have explainability in mm -hmm. what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So if you are that everyday person that you had um, mentioned, so not necessarily like the main consumers are the ones creating it, but the ones that are more impacted by it, mm -hmm. what can they actually do to better understand this and really educate themselves? Because even if, businesses make it available to them. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to seek out that information. So do you think that's an element of it? Like there has to be a shift in culture for them to understand it better or understand how it's actually impacting them? You know, I think it's a, it's a two part issue uh, or maybe even three parts. Number one, companies have to be clear about when consumers are interacting with AI, what's being used X, Y, and Z. I think that part is uh, fairly agreed upon, I, I would hope. The other part is there is an aspect of personal responsibility, right? The, the same way, I mean, you know, digital literacy, right? Let's say in 1990 was relevant, but it wasn't as impactful as it was today if you weren't completely digitally literate. Because today you cannot opt out of the digital world. All of us have a digital twin to varying degrees by our data. All of us like... Right now, we are, instead of sitting in a room all together with one camera, we each have three different cameras, different microphones, and we're coming together. We have to know how to use that. But this applies across the spectrum. So people do, I believe, have to educate themselves on what AI is, how it applies. Um, we launched in 2016 a site called Wandering Alpha to educate people. And since then, it's been used by Fortune 500 companies in their training programs, used by universities, a bunch of uh, different government agencies, et cetera, because we explain not only AI, uh, blockchain, NFTs, everything else like that, but the whole point was to make it simple and concise for someone to understand. One of the things we talked about with AI is for people to understand what it is. Because most people, if you ask a lot of people on just on the street that are not in tech, they just have a regular job, you say, what's AI? They'll start talking to you about robots or, or they'll talk to you about these other. So for them, there's a huge disconnect between them understanding how much AI they deal with on their phone, right. on their computer, in their search engines, you know, day to day. And so for us, we think that there's a bigger chance when, when I explain this, there is a bigger chance that you will be mistreated by poorly designed AI systems than you will be by super intelligence. That is the bigger risk that you have. And so a big part of that is educating yourself and really making sure that you understand that. The third part is it has to be a part of the curriculum at schools. You know, with certain NGOs that we've spoken with and also certain governments, that's been a big focus of them is how to integrate these sorts of understandings into their schools. So that way they start developing populations that understand this from a very young age. They're more sophisticated about what they're dealing with and the data that they're leaving and also the technologies they have to master in order to you know, thrive in the world that we're all going to be uh, going into. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, <clears throat> I'm, I'm thinking through some of the everyday stuff that, you know, you and I and Aaron interact with, right? Let's just take 
Google News, for example, or even LinkedIn, uh, the, the feed that comes mm -hmm. up, right? There's there's definitely a lot of AI behind it on what articles or what posts to surface to the top. Mm -hmm. You're not seeing everything on LinkedIn, for example, right? You're only seeing stuff right. based on your previous behavior, your network and your preferences and so on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think to your point about being literate, I think the onus is on all these providers too, not just a separate, like the Correct. website you mentioned is, is to mm -hmm. be able to explain that, hey, you're seeing this feed because of X, Y, and Z, right? And if you don't mm -hmm. like that, you know, uh, the next step would be to kind of give the power to the end user to say, oh, well, don't show me stuff from this country or whatever, right? I, I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. And and <clears throat> that explainability, like you mentioned, is currently, I mean, non-existent to the most part. Like you, you don't see why mm -hmm. I'm seeing a, a certain news feed, why I get to see some job postings and not the rest. Uh, and, and in certain cities and not the other cities. I, I mean, I just don't know why, right? And, and that explanation mm -hmm. needs to come in first before someone can say, oh, I don't like that, <laughs> right? Today, I can't mm -hmm. even say that because I don't know what, what, it's being, what is being served to me, right? Uh, to, to, to contest it, I guess. I mean, that's kind of similar what happened with the whole location privacy thing, right? Like when your phones right. initially came up, they were starting to collect GPS uh, data points without your consent. And now, you know, because of the awareness and the literacy, People are like, whoa, whoa, what do you mean you're collecting my location, right? And you had consented. Mm -hmm. You just scroll through it and click this accept, right? But you just didn't know what you accepted too. Now it's more evident, right? I think I think that same evolution needs to happen on the AI, uh, especially the algorithms that you and I use on a day-to-day -day basis. What, would you agree? You're, I mean, you're, you're absolutely, no, you're absolutely right. And I think a, a key point is AI codifies the past. Yep is what it does. And I think people don't sound like it codifies the past. Mm -hmm. And so if I were to go, and here's the thing. So I'm also going to touch on data privacy, which is something else when you talked about GPS stuff. But when you think about codifying the past, I don't want to be served things from the Chris, or I should say Christopher, because I told you about what my mom would say, <laughs> right? <laughs> she'll be like, Aaron called you Christopher, but you called yourself Chris. And she'll be very upset. No, no, I know. <laughs> And so then, um, you know, so when you, when you start thinking about it, I don't want to be judged by 10 years ago of that data, because that's a completely different person. Yeah. But the thing is, all of this stuff is stored mm -hmm. and kept and analyzed. Like, you know, many of us, we can go and we can buy several hundred pages of our data from private companies, from data brokers, each of us. Mm -hmm. And I think you would be surprised by how much they know. Mm -hmm. And you would say, how do they know this? Why do they know this? Why do they need to know this? And oftentimes it's updated to within the past 42 or 72 hours. They can even know the pair of shoes you bought, mm -hmm. right? So, which I think is quite scary. And so number one, it codifies the past. And there definitely needs to be explanations as to what's going on and give more power to the end user where they can say, I w I'm interested in these other additional things. So maybe you can train your own algorithm going forward on certain sites. I think that's great. But when it comes to the topic of privacy, because privacy is what governs data collection in many cases, mm. right? And when you think of data, data is really the digital representation of the three of us and everyone else listening, right? It's, it's exceptionally valuable. Now, when it comes to data collection, some people will say, well, I have nothing to hide. They can, they can collect all my data, so which I don't believe is the right way of thinking about it. And I'll explain why. So I'm gonna ask you both a few questions. You guys can answer me yes or no. Mm -hmm. You can't just nod though, because I think people will be listening. So when you guys leave your house, do you lock your doors? I do. Most of the time. Most if of I'm the time. I'm just going to. Yeah, um, but if you're, but if you're well, taking off, you're, you're going to lock your door, your door in general. Then absolutely. Okay. What about um, when you park your car? Do you lock it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yes. What about your phone? So when you have your phone, does it have an automatic lock on there? Yes. Yep. Okay. Now, the reason is because we all have, as humans, you know, and people living in, you know, democratic societies, a certain expectation of privacy and consent, right? That's why you lock your, your house. Mm -hmm. Because people can come into your house. It's not that no one's invited, but you would have to invite them in, right? And there's also a difference between, let's say, inviting your parents over, right? And inviting over someone who's just fixing something 
in your house. If your parents come over, they could walk anywhere in your house and you wouldn't say anything. At least I wouldn't, right? And if the service person were to go start walking in your bedroom, you would say, what are you doing here? You shouldn't, or if they were to start going to rifling through your drawers, you would say, what are you doing? Right? Because there's different degrees. The same thing when it comes to your car or when it comes to your phone. People can use your phone. You can hand your phone to somebody. But if someone could just grab your phone and start going through all your data, all your photos, all your text messages, you would probably be a bit hesitant about using that phone or that product. You would say, I wouldn't like it. What people tend to forget is that many companies are rifling through our lives by scooping up our data all day, every day, every interaction, right? And then using that data to then go and classify us, Mm -hmm. right? And so then there's a few different things. First off, since data has value, you shouldn't be able to scrape it up from people without their consent or without compensating them in one way, shape, or form. Number two, there has to be limits on how you collect those sorts of data because there's a certain amount that you should know about me. Like if I'm, if I'm trying to get a mortgage, right? So you should be able to see how much I earn, what's in my bank account, right. do I have a job, that sort of thing. But other certain key things like my social media history, other things may not be as relevant. And it goes even deeper than that. And so when you start thinking about privacy, and the data that governs it, this is why when I mentioned earlier, is how did you get that data? Right. You know, if you purchased that from data brokers or you got it from a different data bank, how did they get it? Because when you think also about people's rights, there's a difference between harming somebody and wronging somebody. Right. So what, what do I mean by that? If I go and I collect your data without your consent, right, because you've expressed that you don't want to be tracked or something, I collect it from you. I'm harming you because I am going and stealing from you, your data, right? But I haven't harmed you yet because I haven't given you an adverse decision, right? Now, if you're not being, uh, if you get a result from an AI system that hasn't been trained correctly because we have bad data, then that could be harm Mm -hmm. at the end of the day. So a big thing is a lot of people are being wronged. They just don't realize it. And so this is why if everyone were to go, maybe you guys can put a link to the absurd dinner bill. In three to four minutes, people would really understand why they should care about those those topics and data collection, how it can impact them. Because I think one key topic, uh, I know we're, we're almost out of time, but I'll, I'll wrap this up really quick. A uh, key topic is history jumps. It's not linear. Mm-hmm. So when we start thinking about advancements in technology and those sorts of things, is not going to be linear where tomorrow, where tomorrow is just a augmentation of today and yesterday. There are times when we just have these huge leaps forward, right? And things are changed. Now, a lot of those things are going to be powered by data that was collected, the systems we're creating today, and how they're able to treat all of us. Because the key thing that I want you to think of with the Global AI Bill of Rights is we are thinking of how we are creating the world that not only we will live in, but future generations will live in, right? So when I'm doing it, I'm thinking of my great, great grandkids and the lives that they will be living. Are they going to be living in a more democratic society or more autocratic, Mm -hmm. right? And what do I mean by that? If algorithms don't have explainability, they don't have transparency, they don't have those key topics, you're living in an autocracy. You're living in a world of kings where they're not accountable to anybody. It's more democratic, which I believe we should all want to be, then that's where you should be explainable. We should have rights to understand why am I not getting these certain opportunities, right? So those, those are some of the the key things that I think are, are for us to consider. Yeah. Yeah. Christopher, I know we're pretty much at time here. One really final question. If you in 10 seconds could say something that somebody could do today to get started, to understand their data privacy a bit more, uh, do you have any tip that you would have them start with? Uh, Number one, I would say sign up on billofrights.ai. Number one, you can sign up to participate, sign up to get educated, sign up to figure out what the best resources are for you, whether it's for your children, whether it's for yourself, whether it's you as a business owner, or if you're a corporation and you want to sponsor this sort of work, that's another great way also to get started. That's cool. Great. Well, Christopher, it was great having you on. Um, I hope your mom also enjoys listening and hearing your full name, Christopher, <laughs> throughout. Um, oh, she she is. She's going to make me a okay. big thing of lasagna as, as a reward next time I see her. She'll go like, you know, she'll be like, oh, Christopher, I'm so happy. 
Well, send some over to me and rugby. Um, I will. Sounds delicious. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Chris. It was great having you on today. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Bye. Access the full episode of Decisions Now on our website. And don't forget to subscribe to Decisions Now podcast today.